Ambassador John Bolton, former National Security Advisor, uh, we are delighted to have you on our show, on our channel. Thank you, glad to be with you. Uh, and my first question is uh, uh, regarding your interview with the New York Post. You said we left Afghanistan, but Afghanistan didn't leave us. Can you elaborate, elaborate more on this matter? Well, I think the decision to withdraw U.S. and NATO military forces from Afghanistan was a mistake. Uh, both uh, President Trump and Biden wanted to do it, one of their rare points of agreement. But it was under the mistaken belief that if we withdrew militarily, that the United States uh, would not be threatened in the future uh, from terrorist attacks by groups uh, using Afghanistan as a sanctuary, a, a base in the rear area, as it were, uh, and that there would not be other implications both across the region uh, and really globally as a result of the perception that America was withdrawing from the world. Uh, I think, uh, in fact, although public opinion polls in the United States said for many years there was a majority of Americans who wanted to withdraw from Afghanistan, they were never asked, well, what would you think if the consequence of withdrawing was Taliban coming back into power and Al-Qaeda or ISIS or other terrorist groups basing in Afghanistan? And what we see today is public opinion in America very clearly of the view that we are less secure today after the withdrawal than we were before the withdrawal. So that's why Afghanistan is still with us and, and will be for a long time. Mm -hmm. You said also Biden embarrassed the US on the world stage and now allies are wondering if he has a grip on his own administration's foreign policy. Can you comment more on this? Yeah, I mean, I just returned from uh, a little bit over a week in the Persian Gulf area and uh, met with uh, many people I had dealt with uh, during my time in the Trump administration and even before that and spoke with many others. And uh, I think there's a, a general sense that, uh, uh, that the U.S. decision to withdraw from Afghanistan would have far reaching and uh, almost uniformly negative implications in the region. And I think in places like Moscow and Beijing, uh, they've uh, drawn the wrong consequences from that, and, uh, uh, and it puts other American friends and allies in danger, even though they're far away from Afghanistan itself. So I think this perception about uh, American leadership, America's place in the world, uh, has been badly misunderstood, and uh, it will be the subject of real debate in Washington about uh, what the Biden administration's policies are going to be going forward. Mm -hmm. On the other side, what are the repercussions uh, of uh, the U.S. withdrawal from the Middle East on international peace and security? Well, I think we've seen uh, just in, in recent years what happens when an American president decides to withdraw American forces. Barack Obama withdrew from Iraq in 2011, and very shortly thereafter, ISIS arose and uh, we had to return to Iraq. Uh, uh, in order to deal with the ISIS uh, threat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, watching what's happening in Afghanistan now, exactly as predicted, Taliban have resumed control. Uh, and uh, uh, there's every risk that we'll see more terrorist attacks, more instability in Pakistan next, next door, more adventurism in Iran because American forces have been withdrawn from the country on their eastern border. Uh, I think the withdrawal uh, uh, increases the threats to peace and security in the broader Middle East and really around the world. It was, it was an unforced error. We didn't need to do it. Uh, we had a stable presence there. Uh, we were accomplishing the principal objective we sought, which is keeping Taliban from retaking control of the country. There were a lot of problems in Afghanistan. Nobody denies that. Uh, no, no, no place is perfect, uh, and, and there remained a lot of work to do. But, but to leave uh, invited uh, the consequences we've seen, which I think are negative for us, negative for the people of Afghanistan. Mr. Ambassador, you warned that Iran could acquire nuclear weapons. Could such a terrible scenario happen? Yes, I, th I think uh, Iran has never given any uh, indication at all, no evidence that, uh, that they've produced that they've ever made a strategic decision to give up their pursuit of nuclear weapons. 
not when they signed the nuclear deal in 2015, uh, not at any time after that. In fact, we know from the results of the very daring Israeli intelligence raid on Tehran that the entire deal was based on an Iranian lie that they had never had a nuclear weapons program. They, they have had a nuclear weapons program and they still do. Uh, so we don't know uh, whether the Biden administration will yet be able to uh, find a way to get Iran to come back into compliance with the 2015 deal. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think it matters much what the regime says. I don't think they'll meet their commitment, even if they make it. Uh, and I think the Biden administration has just about run out the road on this idea of reviving the 2015 deal. They haven't realized it yet, though, and they, they're still pressing for it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain uh, for our audience uh, the United States relationship between with Saudi Arabia uh, while you were uh, the national security advisor? How it was? Can you describe it? Well, look, it, it's a relationship that goes back to uh, uh, to World War II, uh, and like like all uh, important U.S. relationships, it's had its ups and downs over time. Uh, I think that. Uh, the, the Saudis have been good allies for the United States in, uh, in the first Persian Gulf War, expelling Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, uh, in, in uh, the second uh, Persian Gulf War, in dealing with the Iranian nuclear and terrorist threats. Uh, I think that uh, they've established uh, quietly uh, excellent relationships with Israel on a variety of uh, fronts not leading yet to diplomatic recognition. Perhaps that will come soon. Uh, there have been difficulties in the relationship. Obviously, the Khashoggi affair is the, uh, the most prominent. Uh, but I think they've also been criticized unfairly, for example, with respect to the war in Yemen. The civil war in Yemen could end tomorrow if the Iranians would stop arming and financing uh, the Houthis. This is a, a complex uh, conflict in, in Yemen. We all wish it were over, uh, but that could be accomplished if the Iranians would go home. Mm -hmm. Very important. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, are you with or against the Biden administration stressing on human rights in Saudi Arabia? And what is your thoughts on Vision 2030 held by the Crown Prince Hamad bin Salman? Well, you know, my, my view is the, the U.S. is very clear about uh, what kind of government uh, we have in the United States, how we uh, order our values in our society. Uh, we think that they're values that uh, have universal applicability uh, and that people would be happier and their governments would be more responsive if, if the people around the world uh, uh, followed uh, these principles. But I think it's a mistake for the United States unilaterally to say we're not going to deal with people who don't look exactly and act exactly like we do, because that, that's just not going to happen. It's, uh, uh, it's not that that means we value human rights around the world any less. I think it's a realistic assessment of what our ability to influence other countries uh, really is. And uh, so for that reason, uh, you know, we have discussions with, uh, we, we should have discussions with all countries about these issues, uh, and there will be disagreements at times. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but I would say that uh, the Crown Prince has a very ambitious program uh, for his country. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's encountered uh, some internal opposition. It's, it's, it's ambitious enough that it would cause problems for anybody. But I think he and others in the Gulf, I think, uh, share the same direction he's taken to make sure that the economies that uh, their countries have are based on something other than uh, uh, carbon-based fuel production. Uh, and I think that's the only prudent way to proceed. So I, I wish uh, the Crown Prince and, and Saudi generally uh, all, all the best. And uh, I, think, I think they've got a lot of friends in the United States. I think they should realize that. Mr. Bolton, I have a question from the audience. How can the advanced civilian program of the United Arab Emirates be an important challenge to Iran's dangerous nuclear schemes? Well, I think that uh, the UAE's had a major role in trying to constrain the regime in Tehran from its nuclear weapons program, and they've done it kind of across the board, politically, diplomatically, uh, militarily, quietly, uh, and uh, 
uh, and also in, in uh, civil society, their own civilian nuclear program, where, where we have imposed on them, as, as we do typically, the requirement that to license American nuclear technology, they have to give up uranium enrichment. That's an example for Iran. That's the fundamental mistake of the Iran nuclear deal, allowing the regime in Tehran to, to enrich uranium, even to reactor grade levels. So I think the UAE has been a very important partner for the United States in a whole range of activities and uh, a, very, a very successful friendship. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about the Abraham Accords, uh, Your Excellency? Well, I think uh, these recognitions, mutual recognitions between Israel, Bahrain, the UAE, Morocco, Sudan, I think okay. others are coming. Uh, I think what it represents is the new geopolitical reality of the Middle East that uh, many of the uh, Gulf Arab countries and others uh, see the threat from Iran and, and shows they have more in common with Israel that's also threatened by Iran uh, than they have differences. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a sign of maturity in, in, in these countries. I think others are going to follow. And it's, uh, you know, from the U.S. perspective, we fought wars with Germany and Japan uh, ending in 1945. They're now two of our closest allies. You can overcome historical animosities. And uh, uh, if it leads to a better life for the people of the countries involved, I think that's all to the good. So I think there's significant steps forward. I think there's more progress to come. Mm -hmm. Following your Twitter account, uh, you described the submarines deal with Australia as a genuine pivot. Can you explain why? Well, I think this was a very creative uh, 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 opportunity, uh, really proposed by Australia and Britain, not by the United States. But I think it gives all of us who are concerned about Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific region and, you know, the, including the Indian Ocean brings it right up into the Middle East as well. Uh, this will give, uh, when these submarines are built, will give Australia a, a highly sophisticated technological capability. It's a close, close ally uh, of the United States. We have fought in every war together in the past hundred years. Uh, and so I'm delighted that uh, we'll have this new opportunity to deter aggression in the future. I think there are other possibilities here to expand AUKUS, to augment it, uh, other countries to participate in like ways. I think it's a very, very positive development. Mm -hmm. Another tweet, you said that Biden is wrong to make arms control an end in itself. Can you explain why this matter is very important for the American people? Well, you know, the threat from strategic nuclear weapons is something we've uh, been concerned about since the dawn of the nuclear age. Um, and really what we face now is the understanding that at the end of the Cold War, bipolar nuclear confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union had become a thing of the past. And while we've had bilateral uh, strategic weapons agreements with Russia since then, we are now in a new era because of China's uh, dramatically increasing uh, effort to have a large uh, nuclear warhead capability delivered by ballistic missiles. There have been reports in the paper recently in the media from commercial satellite photography showing the construction literally of hundreds of new missile silos uh, across China, obviously designed for intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, with nuclear warheads. I think it's unrealistic and unsafe to consider arms control agreements today on nuclear weapons that don't include both Russia and China. And China doesn't want that. They say, oh, we're so much smaller than the U.S. and Russia. But that's like asking permission to build up to the levels of Russia and the United States before we have to have a serious conversation with China. It would be a big mistake. They need to be right at the center of the arms control negotiations right now and capped at a lower level. That is the way to international peace and security. And if China refuses to be part of these negotiations, I think everybody should take warning at what that indicates about uh, China's uh, intentions. Mm -hmm. Finally, the Wall Street Journal quoted your book, Faulting Trump for Ignoring Human Rights in China. Again, in the Middle East, we need to know more about uh, this matter. Can you give us details? Well, China's uh, government is recentralizing political and economic power. 
Uh, Xi Jinping is the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. He proved that a few weeks ago at the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, gave the keynote address to the party. They all sat around. They were wearing suits and ties. Xi Jinping came in wearing a Mao jacket. Uh, it shows exactly what he thinks his position is. And he has used the power of the Chinese state to commit cultural genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. He has destroyed the Hong Kong open uh, uh, system that was promised in the international agreement with Great Britain, the so-called one country, two systems uh, approach in Hong Kong that's been eliminated. Uh, and uh, the Chinese government represses religious freedom. So as we discussed before, uh, we, we're not going to impose human rights values on China, but we're going to talk about what our values are. And, uh, and uh, China needs to know that. And if, if they think that that's the kind of system they're going to try and impose uh, around their periphery in the Indo-Pacific uh, or more broadly, uh, they need to understand we will simply not stand idly by. My last question, any advice for the Biden administration concerning how they have to deal with a terrorist group funded by Iran like Hezbollah, Al-Houthis and others? Look, the, the Iranian threat is not just a nuclear weapons threat, although obviously from the U.S. perspective, that's the one we worry about most. But it's also uh, Iran's support for all those uh, terrorist groups that you mentioned and others in the Middle East and more broadly, and, and also uh, Iran's conventional military activity in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. Iran, the regime itself, is a threat. And uh, I think that uh, the people should not misinterpret the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think the American people remain as concerned about the terrorist threat to them and to everybody else as we have been since 9-11. Uh, and uh, we're going to be arguing very strenuously the Biden administration cannot let their guard down. This withdrawal was a mistake, but it's happened. And, and now we have to make sure that we do everything we can to protect uh, our people and those of our friends and allies from more terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. Mr. John Bolton, Ambassador Bolton, thank you for your time. Thank you for all this information that you provided us on our show. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me.